this uh, video is going to do is give you an overview of how to approach this rather than delving into all the detail which is available in the textbooks. So this is all about how we can judge the success of management in, in relation to tectonic disasters. And this particular bit is using parts model to compare the response to disasters from countries at different stages of development. So how much does it help us understand the level of success or the differences in the response from countries at different levels of development? So the part model itself illustrates the recovery sequence after an event, but it does not account for the context and really explain things like um, the role of level of development, but it does indicate that. So as a key overview, if you put several events on a graph like this, you could quickly see the level of disruption, how quickly the relief reduced the disruption, the rehabilitation, and then reconstruction, how effective all that was. And you could simply conclude that one country had done better than another in terms of its management. But that misses a lot of the detail. So what we've got to do is think about how you might assess that. So to begin with, it does provide a good general comparison of the different stages of disaster recovery and indicates the resilience of the communities affected. So part of your answer in any assessment, depending on what the question might be, would be showing how it helps you us understand the success level of these four different uh, stages, pre-disaster, relief, rehabilitation, reconstruction. This goes very well with the frost textbook where you can apply the hazard management cycle. So for example, the pre-disaster part, it gives you an indication of mitigation. So simply we might see a, a country with a lower level of development struggling to be as prepared as a more wealthy country, possibly. So if that was the case, the steep uh, line of disruption wouldn't go down as far. And you could look at each stage like that. So you could also look at the relief, for example, how, work, how good were the government, how good was the governance or government's response to provide immediate assistance. You could bring in the Chinese example of how they released hundreds of hundred thousand troops to help in rescuing people. But you could also argue with the Chinese um, Sichuan earthquake in 2010, that some of those skills for, schools falling down was the, um, was the mitigation good enough? So it helps us do that and it helps us compare one, one disaster with another and focusing on the recovery. Now, the problem with it, like we saw with the um, disaster profiles, is it does not explain or determine the importance of un the underlying reasons. What I mean by that is it does not explain that line. It does mm -hmm. give a comparison but when you look, say, at that um, descending line, it does not explain why that amount of disruption happened. Does it mean the place mitigated really well? Does it mean the event was really big? So what we've got here is um, in terms of explanation, nor does it determine the relative importance of lots of underlying reasons as well, which are listed here. So when we look at things like physical characteristics of an event, every single event's different and you've got a list there of different factors that might differ so for example magnitude is an obvious one so if it's higher on the moment magnitude scale you like to get more disruption regardless of the management and recovery and so on but it's also you've got more complex areas such as um, speed of onset two tsunamis if one hits or affects uh, is released nearer the coast you're not going to have as much time to get out of the way difficult to unpick how well management did compared with in, in, if we look at two events like that because it's not just down to the management it's down to the physical characteristics of the event themselves and unpicking that's really difficult the hazard type not just if you, you could compare earthquake with earthquake but also volcano with earthquake how would you actually do that on a model like this also the secondary hazards I mean you could think about things like land size and liquefaction 
Now, even with the, an earthquake of the same magnitude, one area may suffer liquefaction, one another area may not, because of the local context in terms of how much water is in the soil. Landslides are the same thing. In places like Nepal, you may get landslides, but in places like, I don't know, Christchurch in New Zealand, landslides weren't as much of a problem. But again, that would impact on every stage of that recovery. And there's no explanation in the model to really go through why. You'd have to unpick that yourselves. And it's the same with level of development. The level of development has a huge role. Is it fair to compare one with the other in terms of level of development? How important is the level of development compared with these other factors? Now that's the focus of this. So how easily is it easy is it to compare level of development? The responses from different countries with differing level of development. Because when you've got all these other factors going on around it, it makes it difficult to compare or isolate just that factor. It's too simplistic to just conclude that if one country, just because it's poorer, and doesn't have as much money, it suffers more because of these lines, particularly when the magnitude may have been bigger or the population densities may have differed. So in conclusion, like I say, it does not explain or determine the importance of the different factors that may be at play here, which determine that curve. It won't just be development, and as this is about development, the likelihood it is in the exam, you'll have to talk about how well this helps us compare countries of different levels of development. So the geographical situation of all those countries will be different. So you're going to have problems in the comparison if you're just trying to work out how well management did. Lastly, applicability. How do you actually plot the line? How do you judge level of disruption? How do you define normal and when normal is attained? These are all difficult questions to actually draw that line in a way that is going to suit, um, be absolutely accurate because I don't think it's possible. For example, you might have 100 dead and, uh, I don't know, 3 million pounds worth of damage. Which one's caused the most disruption? It'd be very difficult to plot and compare. So these are the exam style questions you may face. And there's some help there and here, but if you're thinking about this top one, sorry, this middle one, actually, yes, look at the top one. So assess the use of parts model in comparing management of hazard events in areas of different stages of development. Well, it does up to a point because it does allow you to compare them directly, but it doesn't explain the underlying reasons. So in one way, the model is very general, but because of its lack of detail and all the underlying reasons which might be at play, there are weaknesses too. And that will be the direction of your essay. And you probably talk about all the different stages, like these things, and how it is good at helping us look at those stages. But also it's quite simplistic in the sense that it's more difficult, for example, to save people when you've got a densely, population, dens densely populated area affected, regardless of level of development. Okay, I hope that's given you an overview of how to, how to approach that. Thank you.